So, good afternoon. Um, warm welcome to everybody. Those who don't know me, I'm Mike Proctor. I'm the provost here. Uh, I'm not an entrepreneur, although I, perhaps I can learn something today. Um, and it's my job to chair this session and to take uh, the Q&A afterwards. So we're very pleased uh, that you're all joining us today. And this course is going to bound to happen. Thank you. For the launch of the King's Entrepreneurship Lab. Can you hear me clearly? That's the first thing. It's our first hybrid event. So um, we're hoping it's going to go smoothly. And the question is, are the people listening to us online hearing us? Can we, can we find this out? Oh, good. And they, they can hear us. Okay, that's excellent news. Well, maybe not. Maybe better if they didn't. <laughs> um, we're very pleased to be holding this event in the college and online, first blended event. And it will be recorded and uploaded to the college website. So it's very exciting for us, um, this, this new idea of entrepreneurship at King's. We're embracing entrepreneurship and business as academic disciplines in collaboration with the Judge Business School, which is definitely a new direction for the college. Um, although it's got a forerunner, so the King's Entrepreneurship Prize was established in 2014, uh, kickstarted by generous philanthropy. And that's going from strength to strength, including encouraging the development of entrepreneurial ideas uh, and concepts and creativity and know-how can be converted through this into sustainable commercial and even more importantly, perhaps social benefits. So there are two strains to our endeavors there. Uh, we have some of the prize winners in the audience today. So welcome back to you. Uh, and in 2019, uh, we went further and admitted our first cohort of MST entrepreneurship students. And just last week, we had a matriculation dinner for these students. It's our third intake. So we're very excited about that. And this year, we're going to welcome our first cohort of executive MBA students at King's, with our largest in intake of MBAs ever. So this is a growing enterprise. Now, thanks to another very generous donation, the college has established the King's Entrepreneurship Lab to equip students with entrepreneurial skills and support those wishing to explore a career path, innovation, entrepreneurship, and business. With an emphasis on developing sustainable and ethical projects, in line with King's philosophy, with a positive social and environmental impact, the lab's activities will encompass a year-long program for King's students, including an intensive week before the academic year. An entrepreneur in residence scheme, a monthly webinar series, visiting mentors, and much more, as they say. I'm delighted to officially launch the lab today. So many congratulations to those involved in setting this up and getting it all going. So to get this underway, it's my pleasure to introduce our panel, who will each give their perspective on the role of business in addressing global crises and societal change. And we have a panel there sitting at the, on the table. Uh, alumni and representatives, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs, Dr. Gemma Chandralaiki, if I pronounce you correctly, Gemma, Malcolm McKenzie and Sarah Wood, all alumni, and University Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Andy Neely. So thank you all very much for coming. We're delighted to have you here. So after the panelists, we'll open up to the live audience in the Keynes Lecture Theatre and online for questions. For those online, please put your questions in the Q&A box. And if you want to ask a question live, we have this remarkable soft microphone, which somebody will throw at you if you want to ask a question. So we first turn to Dr. Gemma Chandrajalaki. Gemma read natural sciences here and trained as a molecular geneticist. She's currently the course director for the master's program in genomic medicine at the university. Gosh, let me try that again. Genomic medicine at the university and education and training lead for NHS East Genomics. Gemma, over to you, thank you. Um, so, yes, I'm Gemma Chanatilika. I am a, a geneticist by training. Um, I've, um, after um, my degree here at King's, I moved to the US and that's where I pursued a PhD in postdoc. And then I um, joined a startup company. And from there, I've had a very peripatetic career um, teaching in the US, working as a clinician, moving back to the, U the UK, teaching, and then trying to bring about large systems change within the NHS, for which you definitely need an entrepreneurial mindset. Um, so when it comes to the question of um, 
the role in business in addressing global crises and societal change? I feel quite overwhelmed by this question because obviously it's a rather large topic and especially to be the person kicking off this panel. Um, so I think we have to sort of take a step back and think about you know, what is it that the businesses do? And that, from that sort of traditional, um, maybe more traditional idea of the, the role of business is to, is to deliver value to shareholders. Um, or we could take, look at it from the point of view of someone like Mark Benehoff, who would say the business of business is improving the state of the world, um, which is obviously, you know, quite a different standpoint, um, but maybe it's, and it's a vision that extends be far beyond that of creating value for shareholders. Um, but it's maybe more suitable to think about when we're um, talking about issues of global crises and societal change. So, um, you know, thinking about global crises, obviously we're in a pandemic, so this is a, it's, an, it's, it's, it's an easy example to choose. I mean, I'm a life scientist, so, so that comes sort of easily to me um, as, an ex as a set of examples. And we can look at how um, businesses have been involved and how they've kind of pivoted their approach. And many businesses have just, you know, pivoted what they're doing to take advantage of the opportunity that's been provided to make face masks, to make, you know, whiskey companies pivoting to provide hand sanitizer, etc. Um, you know, and, and there's been that real sort of um, exploration of whether they're doing this for, pro for profit or whether they're doing this to help out in a non-profit way. So I think that's quite interesting to think about. Um, we can also look at how business approaches have been taken, for instance, in vaccine procurement and how that's been, um, how effective that's been. So, you know, the UK very much took a, took a page from the, the VC um, startup mentality of portfolio theory and backed a whole bunch of horses in the, in the, in the aim of, um, you know, finding a winner amongst all of those high risk um, runners, um, whereas somewhere like Australia took a more traditional kind of um, uh, approach taking account of the other um, aspects of the political um, situation, such as we need to have a vaccine that's developed in Australia, for example, and, and in this situation that's been obviously less successful. Um, so, you know, both in how businesses have conducted themselves and, and what we can learn from how businesses do that, you know, I think it, there's a lot of um, things to consider for global crises. The thing but relating to societal change, I think, you know, because we're living in this world of social media, it's, it's very, um, you know, companies, more is being asked of them than just to put a product on the market. People are interested in what their values are, and what they stand for as organizations, um, uh, you know, both their customers and their employees, for example. And, you know, we can look to see some of the responses to this and we can look to see how companies are conducting themselves. So if we look at a company like Salesforce, for example, um, we can see that they do various different things and they really have a strong corporate value um, system of corporate values. And that's meant that they are giving philanthropically through their one, one, one um, campaign. They are, um, they are doing very proactive work to try and address the gender wage gap. Um, and they are also um, increasingly involved in what, might, what you might, um, um, think of as politics. So, for example, in 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 their in their um, in the way that they conducted themselves in, in Indiana um, recently with the LGBT um, legislation, anti-LGBT legislation that was going on there, and their and their response to that. So, you know, there are of course many other examples. You can think of Nike and its continue, you know, their continued support of um, Colin Kaepernick, etc., for the uh, and the Black Lives Matter movement. So we can see that businesses very much are involved in societal change, both in responding to it, but also you know, in, to some extent in driving it. And, um, um, and it would be, it's very much a point for discussion as to how much they should be or can be do, doing that. Um, so. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Emma. Thank you. So uh, next I'd like to introduce Malcolm McKenzie. Uh, Malcolm read engineering at King's uh, coming up here in 1977. He's got vast experience in consultancy and advising senior management and boards on corporate performance. And he's managing director and head of, and head of Alvarez and Marcel's European Corporate Transformation Services practice in London. I got all those words in, Malcolm. Thank goodness. <laughs> Importantly for us, he's also chair of the Lab Advisory Board and a tremendous source of guidance and support. So thank you very much, Malcolm. Thanks, thanks very much, Mike. And sort of perhaps building a little bit on what Gemma said, I and mean, none of us knew, know what each other is saying, so, so it's good it sort of follows a little bit. I'd like to share some facts to start off with, and I thought I'd go back to when I was here as an engineering student in 1977 and think about the state of the world then and, uh, and where we are today. 
and a lot of people often get very downbeat about the state of the world. But the reality is, uh, when I was a student here, over half the world was, an extreme, was living in extreme poverty, some 55%. That number, using the UN definitions, is now 9%, less than, nine, less than 10%. Life expectancy, Jim probably knows uh, aspects of this better than I do, but it was 58, 58 when I was here, global life expectancy, it's now 72, 25% increase. Number of kids around the world vaccinated with at least one vaccine to protect them was apparently only about 22% in the, in the late 70s, it's now nearly 90%. How many households have ac access to electricity around the world? It was about half, it's now getting on to 90%. So I, I'm just to take maybe a, a sectoral one, which we all know, but just to sort of make the point uh, a little bit further. I remember when I was a student here, I was involved in a society where we had to get a telephone line. And I remember trying to get a telephone line in the late 70s. It took three months, uh, whereas now to get your new phone. And I remember in the bar, I see you've just all redone the bar, it looks very smart, but we used to have a bank of four or five telephones in there which actually reflecting on it, going back, wasn't very many for um, 300 undergraduates or whatever there was, but that was because um, in today's money, a five minute call cost you 10 pounds. So, um, uh, and now obviously the marginal cost for most, most people is, is, is practically, practically zero. So there are enormous numbers of aspects of the world that have got better. And of course, lots of actors have played a, ro a role in that. Obviously, I remember when I was, here, I did think, should I go into, I think called it development aid or something at that stage, or should I join the foreign office? Because surely policy was where it was all at. But of course, when I reflect back on it now, the real reason that the world has got better is that secret that to a certain extent they discovered in the middle 18th century in, 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 in Edinburgh to a certain extent, which is the secret of 3% compound annual growth. And 3% compound annual growth has Keynes would tell us, I think he had a quote on, on, on compound annual growth, um, is, is a miracle over, over long, long, long periods of time. And so business, no, whichever way we look at it, or those, those, uh, those uh, characteristics or metrics I just, I just shared, business has played a key role, whether it's making people wealthier, whether it's scaling up and distributing vaccines, whether it's... Um, Sorting, sorting out how to uh, modern telephony and, and how to get a telephone. And there's not saying it's all perfect, it's probably not perfect at all, it's far from perfect. Um, and there are lots of, lots of bad consequences as well from business, as well as good consequences from business. And they tend to get a lot of airplay. And I was just reading actually earlier on about Xander or something, a new sort of online credit card, um, which I'm sure, I don't know, it's not longer, but I'm sure it will, take people into certain people into, 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 into poverty and over, over debt. But overall, the big picture, when you look at the big, big picture stats of it, um, uh, business is key in lifting up the world and, and in creating that wealth. And that's why I'm really pleased to be on this panel and a part of uh, setting up the entrepreneurship lab, because I think King should play a, a key role in that as well. Business is about challenging norms, thinking the unusual, making a difference, and, and that's what I think this can, um, this, this, this can hopefully do. So, um, so those are my, my, my thoughts on some of the role of the business. Thank you very much, Rafa. And uh, next, uh, Professor Andy Neely, who is Pro Vice Chancellor for Enterprise and Business Relations at the university here. Andy is former head of the Institute for Manufacturing, director of the Center for Digital Built Britain, and the founder, there are a couple of letters here, and founding director of the Cambridge Service Alliance and a fellow of Sydney Sussex College. Andy. Thanks, Mike. Um, and first, I should say, I guess in my role as uh, Pro Vice Chancellor across the university, I look after everything to do with innovation, commercialization, startup spin outs, and the business. And so I really welcome this particular initiative, the Entrepreneurship Lab. One of the real strengths of the Cambridge innovation ecosystem is just the constant experimentation that goes on across the, not, not just in the university, across the wider city, people are forever launching new initiatives to try and make innovation, entrepreneurship better. And this is a really welcome addition to the, the scene. So I really congratulate King and all those involved in this. And the reason I'm such a supporter of entrepreneurship, particularly from the university perspective, is it seems to me that's the way we get ideas out from the university and actually contribute to society. If you go back to the university's mission, it starts with the phrase contribute to society. 
we will do that to an extent by doing great research, coming up with great ideas. But if you really want to have an impact at scale, you've got to get those ideas out there. And one of the best illustrations of that, that I'll often refer to is um, Greg Winter. So Greg Winter, fantastic scientist, Nobel Prize winner, but Greg's work on monoclonal antibodies now underpins six of the 10 best-selling drugs in the world. Um, and it wouldn't underpin six of the 10 best-selling drugs in the world had we not got the ideas out of the lab. So entrepreneurship to me is a really crucial uh, part of the mission. But if I come to the question, the role of business in addressing global crises and societal change, I was, I was thinking about this and thinking, actually, I, I, I want to break the question down. It's a classic academic response. Um, and the first thing I want to do is question the question. Um, and, and the reason for that is it seems to me there are three parts of this statement that you really need to unpack. There's something about the role of business, there's something about the notion of addressing global crises, and there's something about addressing societal change. So let's start with the first, the role of business. And I'd actually ask the question whether business is actually the right unit of analysis. And if you think about businesses, they don't make decisions, they don't uh, take particular actions, um, it's the people in those businesses that take the actions, that take the decisions. And at one level, all the business is, is a collection of people who are gathered together pursuing some common purpose. That's what you're trying to do with the business, is get people to pursue the common purpose. But it's the individuals who are pursuing those joint goals that we need to think about. And so I think actually, rather than asking about the role of business, we need to think about what the role is of those who influence the direction of business in addressing uh, global change. Uh, the second thing, global crises, we've already touched on a couple of these, no surprise given where we are and what we've been through, we would think about COVID and pandemics uh, as one. Um, we clearly can't ignore uh, climate change, uh, the energy transition. Um, despite the progress we've made around people coming out of poverty, we still have enormous challenges around growing inequality in society. So more may have been lifted out, but at the extremes, people are still uh, really suffering. And if you think about addressing those three crises, pandemics, climate change and, and uh, poverty or, or inequality, um, it seems to me this is all about individual action, actually. Uh, so if you think about the COVID crisis, what we've all learned is that it's our individual actions that influence the outcome for the collective. Hence all the emphasis on social distancing and face coverings and hand washing. It's the actions we've all taken as individuals that have made a difference. Um, when it comes to climate change, it's choices that we make as individuals. It's how we choose to travel. It's whether we buy electric vehicles. It's whether we insulate our homes. There's a lot of choices that we make as individuals that will, again, influence the collective outcome. And growing inequality, similarly. In that case, maybe a smaller group of people who are making choices, but actually the choices that the richest in society make about how much wealth they need to appropriate and how we should change the boundaries around wealth distribution. It's, uh, it seems we've set it up as a zero-sum game at the moment, and that's not a sensible uh, longest, long term strategy. So I would argue it's individual choices that affect the outcome for society as a whole. And actually, if you're going to see societal change, you've got to change the way that individuals behave in society. And that reminds me, there was a, one of my favourite papers is, is um, written by Henry Mintzberg, talks about the five P's of strategy. And Mintzberg argues that, the, that most people, when they think about strategy, uh, they think about strategy as a plan, as a conscious course of action, a deliberate set of things we're going to do. So we'll have this at COP26 this year. All governments from around the world, or heads of state, will get together and we'll talk about a conscious plan that we're gonna try and execute. But uh, Mintzberg talks about four other P's of strategy. So the notion that strategy is a ploy uh, it's, a, it's a bit like a chess game. So you make moves to outwit your competition. Strategy is perspective, a way of thinking about the world. Are you looking at the market or are you looking at what you're great at inside your firm? Uh, strategy as a pattern in, and a pattern of de in the decisions and actions you take. And I'll come back to that one. Um, uh, and finally, strategy is position, the notion that you can choose where you compete in the marketplace. But that idea of strategy as pattern, I think, is really interesting because if you think about the strategy that organizations end up realizing, the strategy they end up enacting, it's all about the thousands of little choices, decisions, and actions that get taken. Take a university like Cambridge. We have never in the past 
um, put in place a mechanism. This is not necessarily going to be university policy immediately, um, but we've never put a mechanism in place to charge for the space that people who run labs or departments uh, occupy. One of the consequences of that in the institution is that people don't really worry about how much space they occupy. In fact, most lab leaders argue they need more space for bigger labs and so on. If we put in place a mechanism to charge for the space that people were occupying, it would change the way people thought about the utilization of that space. If they change the way they think about the utilization of that space, it will also change how much building we do, it will change the embodied carbon in the system, it will change how we use our resources more efficiently. And so actually, I think that when I, when I look at this, for me, the role that it's, like it's not businesses, it's the people who lead and influence businesses. And the fundamental thing they can do in helping address society's challenges is to think about what are the incentives and structures they're putting in place? What behavior does that drive both in their organization and in society more widely? And are those behaviors ones that are conducive to the changes that we'd like to see? Thank you very much, Andy. And finally, Dr. Sarah Wood. Sarah is a leading digital entrepreneur and a diversity advocate. She uh, co-founded Unruly, the go great name, the global video advertising marketplace. And she's currently a board member at decision augmentation company Signal AI and at Tech Nation, the growth platform for ambitious tech entrepreneurs. She studied English here and a PhD at UCL and she's been awarded an OBE for services to technology and innovation. Sarah, thank you for coming Cheers, today. Mike. Hey everyone, um, great to be here. A huge thank you, Gemma, for kicking us off. That's a massive thing to do. <laughs> it's like saying the thing for everybody. Uh, and I'm really aware that it's only, there's only my remarks that stand between um, the audience and questions. So if anyone's got any questions, uh, now is a really good time to formulate them and think about them. Um, because that's always the best part of, of the event, isn't it? When you hear what everyone's thinking and what they've got to say. Uh, so just a few thoughts. Um, I guess it's interesting when you say, Mike, that entrepreneurship hasn't been a huge part of King's over a long period of time. I mean, my perspective is when I was a student here, there was always loads of entrepreneurial stuff going on. It just wasn't talked about using that particular language. Uh, but yeah, Rag Week was a great example of everybody coming together um, raising money, you're raising funds and um, doing cool stuff together with you know, that united purpose. Uh, and then I remember my co-founder, Scott, who was also here with me um, studying philosophy um, at the time, he got his first taste of entrepreneurship when he ran the, uh, the June event. Um, and it, it didn't all go smoothly. Uh, a good time was not had by all. A good time was had by many. <laughs> um, but, you know, these are the things that kind of shape you um, and you know, the moments um, when you realize that entrepreneurialism, entrepreneurship doesn't just live within the confines of a corporate structure, um, but it, you know, it lives everywhere and it lives in our families and the way that we interact with our children and it lives in our communities and the way that we garden our collective garden, whatever it might be. Um, so I just think that's a really kind of, for me, that's a really helpful starting point when I think about entrepreneurship, um, just to, that it reaches across uh, our whole society. Um, the other thing I just wanted to think about was we talk a lot about scale uh, and I totally hear the importance of scale to have an impact and systems change. Um, but I think sometimes we, we overestimate um, the importance of scale. We don't overestimate the importance of it, but we fail to acknowledge the benefits of small. Um, so I think the other thing that when, when I'm talking to the entrepreneurs that are starting out on this program, uh, and the entrepreneurs who are on the Zoom who are starting out on this program. It's great to have fantastic, huge ambitions, and it's great to want to scale and to bring your world-changing product to as many people as possible. Um, but actually, when you're still small, there's lots that you can do. Uh, and even if you stay small, and sometimes because you stay small, there's still lots that you can do. Um, so yes, business does have a role to play in showing how you can scale and do that speedily in a way that democratic governments with a free press will really struggle to pull off. Uh, and yes, um, companies like Facebook or Google um, have shown that they can you know, extend their influence uh, across national borders, become more important than nation states, uh, and that sometimes can be beneficial and sometimes not, as we've talked about. Uh, but actually, often it's in those small businesses and those small interactions, along with the small steps, uh, where you can have the most impact and get the most fulfillment as an entrepreneur. So don't wait to be scaled. Don't wait to be the next Facebook before you start kind of starts on day one with the decisions you make. Who are going to be the decision makers in your business? 
Um, because let's face it, a lot of the challenges we have with businesses today and with capitalism today, um, it's great that these businesses are being set up to solve so many problems, but they're the problems that were solved by businesses of the past. Uh, things like vaccinations, great we have vaccinations, but we had epidemics and outbreaks because the way, you know, the, the, these things have consequences. Um, so I guess I just think, as you're setting out your business, it's not just you. Think about the people you carry with you, the people who are going to be coming on your journey as co-founders, as early employees, because they're going to be massively influential uh, in the shape of the company. Uh, and we need everybody's talents and everybody's brains and everybody's lived experience uh, if we're going to help solve some of the biggest problems that we're facing. Uh, don't underestimate the value of meaningful work. Yes, tech is great, entrepreneurship is great because it can bring fantastic high quality wages to people. They're gonna be able to support their families. They're gonna be able to make great choices for their kids and the people around them. But if you can create a culture and an environment where they're going to have purpose, uh, mastery, they're gonna be able to learn new skills. Um, they're gonna be able to do that in a company which they see has got a wider purpose. They're gonna have autonomy. Probably lots of the reasons that you may want to become an entrepreneur for. You know, you wanna do your own thing. You don't want a boss telling you what to do. You want to do your own thing, carve your own way, make your impact, be the change. So make sure that everyone else around you has the opportunity to do that as well. Um, and then the other thing I would say is about accounting, I guess, and I know you, I hope that lots of you are familiar with um, Jane Gleason White and Six Pillars of Capital. Um, but this is a fabulous book, first published. She's a historian and economist. What a great combination. Historian and economist, and economist who wrote that book in 2015. It's just been republished last year. And it talks about how you know, the reason that business has done so well is because it's had a free ride. Uh, it's had a free ride for many centuries. Uh, and a very small segment of populations have done very well on the backs of invisible labor slave labor, indentured labor, cheap labor, invisible labor, uh, and on the backs of the planet. So you know, seed investors have rights, rivers don't. Um, and Jane Gleason White in her book sets out a new way of accounting. And she talks about the metrics that we need to measure. Uh, and I think this is absolutely key, whether you're the most scaled business or the smallest entrepreneurial outfit, think about the metrics you want to measure because that will tip the balance. So as soon as it's all about the bottom line, well, you're on a race to the bottom. And, you know, and who wants to be on a race to the bottom? Um, it, you know, it, it might make a lot of money, but it's not good for the ecosystem. It's not good for everybody. So whether it's um, carbon, whether it's biodiversity, whether it's community, the, you know, there's all kinds of different ways that Jane Gleason White suggests we should be taking these into account. And businesses you might hope would do this independently, some are. There are some awesome businesses, and I hope your businesses are going to be these businesses, B Corps. Um, that don't just think about shareholder profit, but think about stakeholders. That's really exciting. But not every business is going to want to do that. Um, so the government needs to create a level playing field for those businesses and make sure that the businesses that are doing the right thing, that are taking the time to hire more slowly because they want a diverse workforce, um, to spend more time thinking about their supply chain and probably end up paying more for those goods because yeah, you can always buy something for cheaper, but there's always a cost. Uh, and we just need to start bearing that cost. And the businesses that don't make the right decisions need to start bearing that cost. Um, so, you know, I hope that over the coming years, we're going to see some changes here. We're going to see some incentives for those companies that do the right thing, whether that's lower taxation, more R&D credits. Um, there's all sorts of ways that we can incentivize that. And, and then conversely, for the companies that only care about the bottom line, well, let's hit them on the bottom line. You know, you hit them where it hurts. Um, so maybe there would be an inclusion levy companies don't feel they're able to hire diversity, well, then maybe they need to pay a portion of their profits to someone else who's going to be able to train up those people and make sure that everybody is sharing uh, in the rewards that, bring, that business brings. Anyway, that's probably enough. <laughs> and now I realise I could probably go on for a long time. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks. And there we go. Thank you very much indeed, Sarah. And thanks to all the panel. Thank you. So now we come to the exciting uh, Q&A session, and I hope this is going to work. <laughs> and Thomas here has, has the mobile microphone. So if you want to ask. Mobile microphone with Cam. Uh, Cam, do you want to start with the audience here, or shall I start yeah. with the online audience? Depends, are you, uh, who wants to start? We have off? a couple of questions in the, in the online audience already. Go on then. Okay, okay, thanks. Uh, so maybe just one remark that is being made by Yan Wen Wright, and I think that's a very important point. He's saying there are lots of resources, in particular, Cambridge and Enterprise provide seed funding. Uh, so, I mean, it's good to stress that Cambridge is an ecosystem. 
is a cluster where there are lots of resources. That was more a remark than a question. But there is a really interesting question by Pascal Schreiber, uh, King's College 93, question to Sarah in particular. You ask for questions, Sarah, you're getting questions. Uh, given that King's is a leader in opening opportunities for students from less privileged background, what advice would you give to women, non-binary, non-white or non-wealthy funders starting up now? Uh, how can the underdogs funders stay positive, keep pushing forward and find funding? I love that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's such it's a great question and a great answer um, with the question as well. So it is a real problem to address. Uh, and we see this with funding in particular. So on the one hand, you've got burgeoning capital coming into the UK tech industry, and it's going to good places um, in terms of the sectors, a billion in climate tech last year. But when you look at who's taking that money, which companies are taking the money and who's leading those companies, I'm afraid to say it's not a very diverse set of people. Only 2.3% of VC funds goes to female-led companies. That was in 2020. That is like so, so unbelievably shocking and needs to change. Change is happening. Um, it's so much slower than any of us would have wanted, um, but we are seeing some VC companies specifically set up to address this gap. Uh, bearing in mind that female founders are kind of an under and underappreciated uh, asset class because female founders are more likely to deliver a better business, double the returns of the male counterparts. So there's a real good business case there. Um, but I would say find your clan, you know, find a good set of co-founders um, and be, you know, be emboldened and be encouraged because the discourse around this is changing. Um, more VCs are recognizing they need female partners. Um, only 2.3 or 2.4% of VC partners are female at the moment, 12% of, um, of VC decision makers, but the partners even smaller. That is changing, and there's a recognition that that is changing. Um, but really, yeah, find, find your clan, find your people who are going to work with you, um, and find sympathetic investors because they are out there. Um, and be, you know, be bold and proud. And what you have now is something that everybody is excited about. We all want to see so many more people now recognize the importance of diversity that you can build a bigger business. Um, so now is the moment to be out there building your business, seeking seed funding. And if I can just yes, link... Yes, please, yes. So I was just going to link another point, which was actually the point the questioner made, is user networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like that's one of the things that the, the lab is about is... There's a tremendous network in Cambridge and among the alumni, um, which we can probably do more to bring it, bring it, bring, bring that, you know, make that a bit more available. Use a network and that can help overcome some of the, the barriers that Sarah and Sarah was talking about. So a couple of things. I'm going to do a quick plug for Cambridge Enterprise because you got <laughs> mentioned already. Um, and, it, and you're right, I mean, there's a really big uh, ecosystem here. Um, in fact, there's about well, when I came into the place, I, I look and there's about 40 odd initiatives supporting innovation and entrepreneurship across Cambridge. And at first sight, it can, see, it can seem a bit daunting, but I, but I think it's organized in a, there's an underlying structure to it, which is quite important to understand. So at the, at the base, there's a, um, a sort of foundation, I call it the knowledge engine, lots of people coming up with really interesting ideas. There are then three vertical pillars. So the first one's about support, and that's all about finance and IP. Cambridge Enterprise um, has seed funds. In fact, the seed fund team in Cambridge Enterprise is dominated by a female seed fund team. And when you look at the data on numbers of startups in the university, it's also quite heavily skewed towards female founders, which are some of you were looking at the board recently. So there's funding through Cambridge Angels, um, CIT, Cambridge Innovation Capital, Amadeus, et cetera. Second vertical pillar is about space. So there's lots of spaces around the city to support people, so idea space over on West Cambridge or in the middle of town or on the biomedical campus. There's the Bradfield Center. And if you're, if you're a growing business, you know, you need a space for three people, you go to the Bradfield Center. They've got modular office space where you get space for six and then nine and 12, up to 30 odd. And then you'd graduate from the Bradfield Center and go and take your own uh, space on a sign park somewhere. And then the third bit is around the skills and the business school runs some fantastic programs to help entrepreneurs. The Maxwell Center run programs to help entrepreneurs. But across the top, and the bit that I would really, and it is the network piece, I often talk about Connected Cambridge. There are enormous numbers of networks that bring people together across the ecosystem. So if you're into the internet of things and sensors, you join Cambridge Wireless. If you're an entrepreneurial postdoc, you join Epoch Entrepreneurial Postdocs at Cambridge. If you want to learn from local entrepreneurs, you might join Q or QTech, Cambridge University of Entrepreneurs. Um, if you are in the life sciences area, join one nucleus, because that's where all the life sciences people hang out. And the really nice thing about those networks is that there are then 
nodes or individuals who, who span multiple networks. And so it's really easy to get to almost anybody in the ecosystem you want to get to. So I was at a do on Tuesday this week with Cambridge Angels. It was their 20th anniversary. And most of the serious uh, multiple uh, entrepreneurs in Cambridge were just milling around, having a chat with other people. And there were lots of introductions and conversations going on. And people were just keen to learn about the next uh, set of ideas. So I think that point about using the network is absolutely important. The only other thing I'd say is for those who are starting or thinking about starting up businesses, um, I would watch out for the postdoc competition as well. So on an annual basis, there's a really good business plan competition that Cambridge Enterprise uh, sponsors and it gets advertised across the university. And it's, even if you're not in the competition, actually going and seeing people present their ideas for their businesses, are just inspirational. And you see quite a diverse group of people there just presenting what they've been thinking about in their pitches, super, super presentable. Um, yeah, no, I mean, just a few comments, really. I think, I mean, what's been really exciting from a King's perspective, um, um, working with the entrepreneurship competition with um, Sarah and some of the other judges who are here in, in the audience today, um, is we really see, you know, quite a lot of diversity in, 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 in those bringing um, um, business plans to competition. Um, in the previous year, where we've had all, all winners with female founders, um, so certainly within the King's community, you know, there's, there's plenty of support for that. And I think, you know, but it, it comes from having the diversity at all the different levels in the system. So it's not enough just to have diversity in the ideas that are coming up. You know, we have to have diversity in, in amongst those who are judging those competition ideas. You know, it makes more sense to Sarah and myself when we're thinking about products for menopause than it may do to some of the men in the audience on the judging panel, um, for example. Um, yeah. It, um, you know, those who are funding, you know, we, we know that VCs are not diverse. Um, there's a whole, you know, there is um, um, an effort underway, um, Diversity VC, which actually my husband, who is a VC, is actually heavily involved with. Um, so it, it requires everybody in the ecosystem to, to do this work. So if, if you're not particularly representative of a, of, a, of, a, of a minority yourself, it requires you to really ask those questions and to look at your own data, to look at your companies, to look at your um, to look at your compensation, to look at your um, investments, to look at um, the you know the, the people who are making the decisions, the people who have power in the room, because we know that power is not distributed um, equally. Um, and and you know if we're thinking about the roles of individuals, as, as you as you mentioned at the, at the beginning about how businesses are individuals, but we know that you know in the, there there is discrepancy in, in how power and assets are distributed in society. So. It's important to look at all of these. I mean, you know, I think when Mark Benhoff was looking at, they, he didn't think he had a wage, a gender wage problem in Salesforce. He thought they were a very progressive company. And it took a couple of women to actually say to him, I don't think it is. Um, we need to actually audit this. Then they audited it. And then they found that they did have a problem. So, you know, he was on board. He had to buy into doing the audit, but it wasn't him having the idea to do the audit. That was some, I mean, he was open to the idea when it came to him. But equally, he could have been, he could have initiated that audit himself. So I think you know we have to look at um, the whole system from top to bottom, and those who've got power, you know, it, and um, who may not even realise that some of these struggles exist. It's inherent on 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 you two to actually sort of do some of that work. Thank you very much indeed. You want to take another online one or on one? I in think uh, Cam is going to take. Okay. The next one in the audience. Next one in the audience. Put your hands up. Oh. You there, there's a hand. Yeah, I'm. Running. I want to see this actually thrown. <laughs> Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm Steve Yarney. I, I was at King's in 1980, uh, also read engineering. Um, so my question is, is uh, a quite a basic one, really. It's about the, the, the intended reach of the King's ecosystem. So who, who do you think is going to be using the resources of the entrepreneurship lab? And is it students? Is it... Uh, fellows? Is it alumni? Is it all of those? Is it other groups as well? That's that's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Should I kick off? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think the real goal of it, we, there are quite a lot of assets already in place, as we've heard, like the prize, like the things we we're talking about, uh, and this is being on a university basis. I think certainly what motivated me to get involved around it was when I was here, everybody was in their discipline, their functional subject, 
And whilst you had lunch and dinner and parties and so on with people from lots of other disciplines, the idea of doing things cross-disciplinary, if you like, and creating something new was maybe a part of a, a, a June event might happen there, but not so much in, in, in your, your academic subject. And I think certainly what, what I'm motivated by is opening the eyes of students who are not studying business, so not those on the, on the Judge Business School, to really the possibilities of entrepreneurship, whether it's social entrepreneurship or in the commercial aspect of it, to create something and to, and to build something new. It is absolutely aimed at uh, both undergraduates and graduates. And I think it's aimed at the college as well, building on the, uh, you know, the entrepreneurship prize and some of the other aspects that we've been talking about. Um, I, I certainly think there's an opportunity for the college. You know, uh, I mentioned it plays to the strengths of challenging challenging the norms and thinking the, un, uh, think, thinking the unthinkable and, um, uh, and making a difference in, in, in society and in the world. Um, to sort of bring this into the culture of the college a little bit more explicitly than perhaps it has, so, so that will influence the fellowship, I guess, around it. Um, it is, you know, it, it was designed for kings, you know, rather than making it too broad, so it's not a university as, asset, it's, it's it deliberately focused on the college to open the eyes and give the possibilities and some of the tools and, uh, and foundations for people in the, in, in the way that we're talking. That's certainly um, how I, I'd see it. Anyone else? Yes, Andy. Um, so I'm a, it's, it's interesting to hear that, that, that description, Jeff, because actually there are, this is something that's happening in quite a lot of different colleges at the moment. Um, and I think that's great. I mean, the colleges themselves are communities and it's really important things happen within that college community. The other thing that's happening, I was talking to the uh, incoming, sorry, the outgoing president of QTEC, who was saying that they were really keen to now get uh, reps from across the colleges to meet up, to share their experiences in the different local things. And so I think there's a, if you like, there's the college activity, and then there's a horizontal network as well. And we need to, we need to plug into that horizontal network as well as do the things locally. Anyone else want to talk about that? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, I think someone is in front of you. Yeah. Yeah. First and foremost, very excited about this all. Um, it's great to see that King's is pushing this topic forward. Um, thank you also for, for all of your opinions today. I wanted to pick out two things and connect them onto a slightly higher level to hear your opinion on um, what I would imagine is a slightly more systemic issue. So I actually find it very dangerous to talk about individuals and the power that they have specifically, and also about networks. Um, partly, um, you, Sarah, have pointed this out because what we have so far seen is tremendous amount of power in the hand of specific individuals, some of whom have um, insanely abused that power, particularly in, in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, right? And we've already heard that there is going to be a focus on sustainability, which I think is exactly the type of thing that we need. Um, so one point would be, how do you actually, as an institution, for instance, a university or a college, but even higher, again, Sarah, you talked about this, as a state or, or a city or whatever, um, setting incentives, what is it that we need in order to um, steer individuals, incentivize individuals in the right way to, for instance, think more about sustainability, right? And the same is true for networks. If you're telling people to tap into existing networks, what happens is usually what we've been seeing a reproduction of white male elite educated entrepreneurship circles, right? So how do you, again, possibly as an institution, start a new flywheel, right? Start a flywheel for female founders, start a flywheel for founders who are black, right? And so perhaps that as a, an impulse. An interesting um, point that you program that's launched um, in the UK recently is the Libra program by Tech Nation. So Tech Nation um, is a growth platform for ambitious tech entrepreneurs, and it's all about scaling and helping those businesses grow. Um, and I think we felt this very frustration uh, as an organization that we were working so hard with all the right intentions to be inclusive and to bring in as many different types of people as possible, whether that was geographical diversity, we were very London centric. So this was in itself a huge push to kind of get beyond the M25, whether it was gender, um, ethnicity, disability, the, the lenses, are, they, there, are, there are many ways of looking at it. And we felt we were really struggling um, and so we, we've kind of taken the step of launching Libra, uh, and it's the first program that is for founders who self-identify as black or of mixed heritage, 
um, because we just you, you can't wait for this to happen naturally over a generation because actually maybe it won't happen naturally over a generation maybe it hasn't happened naturally over the last however many generations so why would this generation be any different um, so I think those kind of programs um, can be really impactful. We yet to see you know, what the outcome of that's going to be. It's underway at the moment. In fact, the kickoff event is next week. Um, and so that, that's exciting. And I'm sure we'll see lots more um, programs like that. Um, but it's not enough to leave it to the grassroots. Um, there does need to be kind of help. And uh, you know, the network needs to get together. And to the point, I think a couple of you have made this, this point and the questions have made this point. Often, you know, privilege is invisible. Uh, and that's a real problem because you only you don't recognize it if you're on the right side of it or the wrong side of it, depending on your perspective. So I never really realized the privilege that came with having a Cambridge education. Um, never, really, never really noticed it, still don't notice it most of the time because it's just it's, it's the water I swim in. Um, and I don't uh, it doesn't seem to me to be anything until I meet people who don't come from that background, who didn't go to university uh, and they just they behave differently. And often the biases that I then um, display unconscious biases that I don't mean to display, but I just can't help it because a lot of it comes down to behavior. And I'm used to certain behaviors and discourses, ways of talking, ways of interacting, and it's uncomfortable to come up against different, different ways. So there's so much work to be done. Psychology, you know, but as Gemma was saying, it's a whole system holistic approach. We've all got to start somewhere and it won't be perfect. And we'll do the best that we can and we'll work together. Anybody else in the panel? I think Stuart wants to ask a question. The, the microphone will reach you. We, I don't think we've really got into the question of what the role of business is. I, I think with respect, Andy, you kind of sidestepped that. Um, and the role of business is important to us because by transference, there's the role of kings. And what is the role of kings in producing business leaders of the future? So I do think we need to get back to business. Um, there was a meeting last week in London of... 10 leaders of businesses with sales of 500 million to um, over several billions of turnover. And all the people there recognize the need for sustainability and um, in, in the case of um, climate change and other pressures, none of them really understood that there's a disconnect between board strategies, talks of strategies and networks and so on. And what people whose jobs are affected are thinking on the factory floor. But every time we make um, a move to try and impose new strategies, there's a fallout that is to do with, uh, with um, social dislocation. And um, there's a very good example of that happening in a book which some of you will have read, Janesville by Amy Goldstein, what, what happens to a manufacturing community in, in an automotive town in America when the jobs suddenly go. It's serious stuff. And it's because um, those worries are there that EU tariffs are going to have a damaging effect on India that has coal-fired production. Not just China is reluctant to um, reduce its emissions, but also Australia, which is reliant on um, coal-powered commodity production. Um, so I think that one of the things that, that I hope that the King's Entrepreneurship Lab will do will be to um, produce leaders of, and influencers for the future who can not only ask these questions, but get into the nitty gritty of communicating answers. Um, one thing that's happening at the moment is that big business has got on board the idea of having measurement, reporting, and um, incentives on what they call ESG performance. That's environmental, social, social and governance um, outputs, including emissions, diversity, water, and energy. But what's happening on the ground is that those reports are owned by the chief financial officers. And they're, they're put into the annual reports, but they, um, the meaning of those figures is not disseminated in the way it needs to be done through management, supervisory staff and employees. So I'm, I'm back to the point, what, one of the things I hope we'll get um, at King's is training future leaders who are socially aware and savvy and communicate these needs through society. 
you very much, Jeff. Come on to the panel. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, you, you sort of touched on some of this, Stuart, with, you know, there can be external incentives from, you know, from a government saying you have to hit these, 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 these you know, key performance indicators in these certain areas, and then, you know, that sits with the CEO and they figure out how they can take that box, which is a very, you know, it's a very different way of behaving from a company, for example, where they're, they have got a strong values driven corporate culture where they are, you know, those things are embedded in their corporate culture as they have to take. It's a very different way of behaving. And so I think, you know, that, you know, having that kind of stakeholder mindset, you know, in determining the company's values, you know, thinking about the employees, thinking about obviously the customers, but also thinking about the community and the environment as, as the stakeholders in the, in the, in the, in the corporate activity, as well as the shareholders, um, but not the shareholders to the to, to, to the detriment of everybody else. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would be interesting to know, like you know, to sort of have that 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 the philosophy, you know, in our, in our future business leaders, a more stakeholder driven philosophy, so that it's embedded in corporate culture rather than just being, you know, that that kind of doing it for the sake of reporting it and not getting into trouble and fined otherwise. I can perhaps I'd like to add another couple of aspects. One is the role of the of the customer, the consumer, mm -hmm. which is much more powerful really, but than many of the others. Mm -hmm. You know, some people won't buy food.com or whatever because the clothes are sourced badly, then the business collapses. Mm -hmm. And so I think how one ensures information is well disseminated and encourages customers, which is all of us, mm -hmm. that's the most powerful lever on any business. Um, and I, I'll give you an example in that Mike said, you know business that I run is a sort of advisory business and these are probably not what you'd think of normally as the most socially enlightened but quite a few private equity houses say to us now if you haven't got 40 percent of women on your team we're not even going to consider you doing this piece of work for us you know and they're a customer of ours and that's a pretty powerful incentive mm -hmm. I, can, I, can, I, can, I can tell you and also I very much like your use of the word leadership because I think this is what it's about I mean in a way this is what's a bit different and it's maybe a bit of a conundrum in a university context universities are great at analyzing and commenting and say it would be better if and all the rest of it what this is about is doing and making it happen and unless you make it happen which means leaders who are going to make it happen building up eventually, eventually like sarah was describing or whatever then you know the commentary is just commentary and i certainly hope that's one of the things that comes out of a lab is that we um, we help equip people with some of those leadership skills to make it happen make a difference and you know we'll have an argument and a good discussion about uh, are we doing all these other characteristics correctly? Thank you. Uh, uh, well, sorry, the, Andy would just like to say something. I'm sorry to go pick up on, on your comments. I, mean, I think that was part of why I raised the Minsk Berg realized strategy of a pattern of decisions and actions. Because I think what we need in organizations is leaders who absolutely think about how do you set up the system to encourage the right decisions and actions at the at across the whole organization. It's all very well. COP26 is all very well with the political leaders getting together and saying, that's what we need to do. But ultimately, unless you change the incentives and the things that influence the way people behave in society, you're not gonna see any change on the back of that. And we need leaders who can think about that systems level perspective and how you really influence the choices that individuals make. Sorry, you want to? No. Oh, yeah, just quickly. Yeah. Yeah, ideally, absolutely, it would live in the values of a company um, and, and founders will be motivated to do the right thing and, and they'll recognise the value um, of, of building those types of companies. And that's what the optimist in me believes and the cynic in me believes that you know, that may not be the case and they need to live on the balance sheet. Um, you know, they, need their own, they need their own lines uh, and companies that don't perform well against carbon goals, against diversity goals, against wildlife goals, against community goals, and then have to pay the actual price for that, and then they'll sit up and listen. Thank you. We have a question here. Do we have any online questions as well? Uh, I'm thinking the next. Question. Okay. okay. Yeah. Um, yes. What you're describing to me sort of almost sounds like a brand, where instead of starting with a profitability and a mission statement, you're starting with sustainability and climate, and you know addressing inequality, and starting with that as your brand, and then sort of pulling in entrepreneurial activities. Um, from that base and then sort of putting the entrepreneurial activity on top of that. So my question is, um, is King's College or is Cambridge planning on any type of joint ventures with entrepreneurs? Um, I'm thinking of like an Oxford AstraZeneca type of, you know, joint venture where you start with these goals in mind and then you find the projects and pull in 
the, um, the entrepreneurialism on top of that. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I can't comment on the broader universe. Right? I can, can comment much, much better on that. I suppose the thing that struck me is entrepreneurs succeed because they have a clear view of a, a product or a service that they want to deliver. And that product or service has attributes around it. So it might be to do with diversity or greenness or something, something around that. But I think that's where they start with a single minded focus on a product or vision. So I'm just a little bit sort of questioning, starting with the other attributes around it seems a bit curious. And I certainly don't think that's what the lab's about. The lab is about equipping people with skills around entrepreneurship. And absolutely, they should be very mindful and make a difference in the values that they use or uh, their impact. And I completely agree with some of the comments about externalities and how externalities are measured and, and taxed and so on. But if you don't have a single minded view on a, a product or a service with attributes around it and a customer base, a feel for that customer segment you're going for, um, it, it, won't, it won't make a difference. I mean, I struck. My son, who's in his late 20s, one of my sons actually, um, had the delight of going to an IPO last Thursday, <laughs> which is very good. I mean, he's not the founder of the business, he's, but he's employee number 12 or something like that. So he's been key in, in helping build that up and scale that up. And just chatting to him after he'd recovered from all the drink uh, on, Saturday, on Saturday, he'd recovered a bit. Um, you know, it was a single-minded vision, and this is a remittance business for uh, migrants from uh, from poorer countries who are working with richer countries. It started off actually with the U.S. Philippines sort of corridor, as they call it. So it's remittance. It's tackling. Um, uh, it's attacking Western Union. Western Union is the traditional provider of doing that, and it charges seven percent. And it's basically disintermediating that and digitalizing it. But you know they've been successful, and they're doing lots of good because remittance actually is an enormous source of uh, income into, into poorer countries, but they had a single minded view on that vision. That's why that business is as IPO. Thank you. Andy. So from a university perspective, I, I mean, I agree with Jeff. It's, it's not that you can start with those sort of broader things and say, how will we uh, build a brand or sport around this? But, but we are making some choices. So for example, we recently um, the finance committee allocated 30 million to the seed funds that Cambridge Enterprise run. 10 million of that has been ring fenced for technologies or businesses that are to do with the energy transition and climate change. And so we're trying to signal into the university community that we're interested in ideas. We still need people to come forward with a, a fantastic new material or a new way of carbon pricing or whatever whatever it is that they think they can build their organization around. They still want to have that core idea and that single-minded drive around it. But we're trying to encourage work in particular areas by making the investment available. And I think that those are the leaders we've got. Um, so how many questions have we got left? Yes, we have a couple of questions. Well, that's I will summarize them. Uh, there was a point made by David Co about uh, provocative point that uh, entrepreneurship might be taking away some really smart people from other organizations or other initiatives. And I think your point, uh, Malcolm, kind of addressed that, uh, the idea that uh, there can be entrepreneurial spirit, entrepreneurial effort within large organizations as well, and they matter as well. So I'm going to get to a, a, an actual real question by Richard Heggy, um, who asked, what challenges and opportunities would you focus on if you were starting a business today. So we want to know your, your secret to a successful <laughs> business. It's a fee. Yes. And, and, and just one separate question. I thought that was a good potentially final question, but a, a separate question is, Sarah, the book you mentioned, I was, uh, it's, people are asking for it on the chat and I couldn't, uh, couldn't catch the name of the author. So. Jane Gleason White, G-L-E-A-S-O-N, and the book is called Six Capitals. Thank you, thank you. So, so, the, so should we each give an answer then? So it was, yes, uh, it was the yeah. attributes or whatever. Shall we, is that a good way of doing it? Um, looking for, looking for I, I will put my hands up and say I have a conflict of interest. I, I, I also work with a charity in the rare disease space. I'm a geneticist, so I, you know, I, I feel very passionately about um, individuals who, um, who are affected by rare disease. One in 17 individuals is, infected by, is, is affected by a rare disease. One in 17 people is affected by a rare disease. So that's a huge space. That is a tremendous area of un unmet need. Um, very little has been is, is being done there in the many opportunities. I'm starting to see people make clothing that is actually 
easy to put on for people with disabilities. But just starting now to see this, just starting now. Um, Microsoft has been developing things with you know, individuals with visual impairment or um, individuals who have tremors to be able to use a mouse. There's so much opportunity um, in, 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 the, in the area um, of, of um, rare disease and um, products and services for people with individuals. I think it's a huge area of unmet need. Yeah, I'm going to, I'm not going to share my latest idea. It's really good to talk, so not at the moment. But I think the attribute I would pull out is teaming, that entrepreneurs, even if you sometimes see somebody's name at the top of the top of the paper of the company or whatever, they succeed because they assemble a good team together of people who challenge and stretch them. And I think that's an attribute which I'd like to pull out. Um, so would be a long list. Um, I mean, I absolutely agree with the teaming. It's clear from the, you know, when VCs, venture capitalists are looking at where they invest, they look at the team uh, as well as the idea a lot. Uh, I think a really crucial one is perseverance, actually. I mean, the number of people who talk, but when you, when you hear their story of their entrepreneurial journey, they have run into brick walls and then they've gone, I can't smash that one down, so I'll go around it or I'll climb over it or I'll dig under it. I mean, they just constantly get back up and have another go. And it's that perseverance that I really think makes things work. Yeah. Um, a good, healthy dose of optimism <laughs> always helps, a sense of humour. Um, things go wrong all the time. Um, you want great people around you, and things will still go wrong. So it helps to be able to um, you know, work well together and still manage to kind of enjoy that bumpy ride. Uh, in terms of ideas and what I would be working on, I guess businesses I'm investing in at the moment are the ones that I feel most passionately about can be successful. Uh, and the most recent investment was in a company called Byway, uh, which is founded by a, a member of my own team, my former team Unruly. And that's one of the most amazing things as entrepreneurs you're going to find. People that work with you as employee number one, two, three, four, and five will go off and do their own amazing companies. Uh, and that, that's super cool. Um, but flight-free travel. So it's all about um, enjoying the journey. Uh, and I think the most successful entrepreneurs uh, are the ones who really can enjoy the journey. Thank you very much. Have any more questions arrived in the last two minutes? We've come, it is, it is 3.30 <laughs> and there are no more <laughs> obvious questions. So providentially, we don't have to extend this. <laughs> Just want to thank very much everybody for listening and asking questions. Thank you very much to the panelists uh, for answering uh, at length and, and uh, really taking the questions um, very seriously, it's very good. Uh, I want to uh, also thank those who have supported and been involved in entrepreneurship at King's this year. And I haven't mentioned yet Kamiya and Toma who have uh, started all this event off and have uh, put together the plan of the, of the lab. So thank you very much to them. Um, and thank you for the audience, both here and remotely. And I hope the remote, uh, those that remotely feel they've got a decent experience. I'm very interested to hear your feedback on how this has gone, actually. Uh, and we invite you and all of you to get in touch if you'd like to be involved further. And do come to our monthly seminars. Well, not ours, because it's not my lab, but <laughs> the monthly seminars uh, hosted by the lab. So thank you all very much. And thank you particularly to the panel again. Thank you. Thank you.